A very good day to you and welcome to our, our stable. <laughs> it's just so good to have you at Shalom. And folks, today I want to speak to you about the description of Jesus. That's right. You know, Jesus says, if you lift me up, I will draw all men to myself. And this program is purely about lifting up the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. If you look around you, you see the signs of the times are evident. Jesus told us that these things would happen before he returns. So if maybe you've got some doubts in your mind today about who is this man from Galilee. Maybe you're asking the question, did he really live? Uh, maybe you're asking, is there really any evidence? Well, today I want to tell you about the person, the, descript the physical description of Jesus Christ. And I'm hoping that as we discuss that together, you and I, that we'll start to have a greater reverence and a fear of God. You know, the Bible says in Job chapter 28 and verse 28, the fear of God, that is wisdom. And to depart from evil, that is understanding. We really need to understand that the God that we serve is a holy God. Job chapter 28 verse 28. So folks, today we're going, to, we're going to concentrate on who is this man? This man that even the waves and the wind obey him. I mean, Peter was overwhelmed when he saw how Jesus calmed the storm when they were caught in the middle of Lake Galilee in that, that little fishing boat. This man that can raise the dead, who is he? This man who can take two sardines, two little fish, five barley loaves and feed 5,000 men. That's not including women and children. And then collect up 12 baskets of leftovers after. Who is this man? Surely he is the son of the living God. Now, if we go to our agricultural manual and we go to the book of Revelation, it's the last book in the Bible. And I want to read some scriptures about his description. Now, folks, John was the last surviving disciple. All the rest had been martyred. Now, for the young people watching this program, what does that mean, martyred? It means they did not die a natural death. It means they were murdered. Okay, James, the brother of Jesus, his head was chopped off. Okay, Peter, the big fisherman, the legend says he was crucified upside down in Rome because he didn't want to be crucified like his savior. His wife was crucified before him. These men paid the ultimate price. For who? For this man. Who is this man? Surely he is the son of God. Thomas died in India. They beheaded him as well. Um, Andrew, um, I think he died in Greece, if I'm not mistaken. These men, each and every one of them died a martyr's death. Now, why would they die for somebody who wasn't the son of God? There's no ways they would do that. If we go to the, gospel, uh, the, the, the book of Revelation, I'm just going to read a couple of scriptures for you. Revelation chapter 1. And I'm going to read from verse 10 to 18. Now, John, as an old man, was banished to the Isle of Patmos. And there he had a revelation. And he wrote it down. That's where the book comes from. He was an old man. This is what he says from verse 10. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. And I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet. Saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega. I am the first and the last. And what you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia. To Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatra, Sardis, uh, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Verse 12. Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, that's Jesus, clothed with a garment down to the feet and girded about the chest with a golden band. Verse 14. His head and his hair were white like wool, as white as snow. And his eyes like a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass, 
as if refined in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. Verse 16. He had in his right hand seven stars. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. That's the word, folks. The Bible describes the word of God as a sword, a sharp two-edged sword. And his countenance was like the sun, shining in its strength. Have you ever tried to look in the sun when it's fully blown at midday? That's exactly what he says he looked like. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as if dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and of death. The keys of Hades and of death. Hades being the unseen realm. Folks, that is a description of the Savior of the world. I want to tell you that there is more evidence that Jesus Christ walked on this earth than there is that Julius Caesar walked on this earth. Yet why do you and I continue to doubt him? I get letters in the post. Are you sure that Jesus is the Son of God? Folks, John saw him with his own eyes. Now, if we go back 600 years before this, we go back to the time of Daniel. I want, I want you to go with me to the book of Daniel. I love the word of God. It's, uh, it's life for me. Cha Daniel chapter 10 and from verses 5. Let's see what the word says. Now, Daniel also had a vision of the Lord Jesus Christ. And listen to this. Verse 5 says, I lifted up my eyes and looked and behold, a certain man clothed in linen, whose waist was girded with gold of Euphrates. His body was like beryl, his face like the appearance of lightning. Sure. Ever seen lightning in the afternoon in a thunderstorm? It's a scary thing to see, folks. Lightning, his eyes were like torches of fire. His arms and his feet were like burnished bronze. You see, there we are again in color, and the sound of his words like a voice of a multitude. And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision, for the men who were with me did not see the vision. Folks, we need to open our eyes wide. The Lord says he's going to come in the clouds. Some people won't see him, although the Bible does say every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. But here we have a situation where Daniel's standing with his friends. But you see, Daniel's been preparing his heart, folks. He's been fasting. He's been praying. He's been expectant. The others weren't. So he saw Jesus and they didn't. Be careful that the Lord doesn't pass you by and you didn't recognize him. But a great terror fell upon them so that they fled to hide themselves. Verse 8. Therefore I was left alone when I saw this great vision. And no strength remained in me, for my vigor was turned to frailty in me, and I retained no strength. He just started to literally crumble. His knees went like jelly. He couldn't speak. He couldn't move when he saw the presence of Jesus Christ manifest. Verse 9. Yet I heard the sound of his words, and while I heard the sound of his words, I was in a deep sleep on my face with my face on the ground. Folks, he, when he's seen that, when he saw that magnificent um, uh, description of Jesus physically, he fell to the ground, fell to his face. And that's why I've got a word here for some people who say, when I meet God one day, he's going to have to give me some answers. My dear friend, you have no concept of who God is, if you can say that. I get letters in the post, not many now and again, of angry people. And I understand. I really do. I don't condone it, but I understand. They've lost a loved one. Maybe something's gone sour in their lives and they're blaming God. And they also blame God's people too, by the way. Okay, so we can jump for joy when they say that because Jesus says, if they say all manner of evil about you for my name's sake, jump for joy. To be associated with God is a huge honor. And they, they thump the table and they say, well, when I get to heaven one day, God's going to have to give me some answers. I want to tell you, when you get to heaven, you won't be saying anything. 
You'll be like Daniel on your face when you see the awesome power of God manifest through one man. His name is Jesus Christ, the Son of a God, the second person of the Holy Trinity. God said one word and this whole universe came into being. You talk about power. There's no power on this earth that can, can, can compare. He says here, he trembled uh, on my knees and on the palms of my hands. Verse 11. And he said to me, O Daniel, man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak to you and stand upright, for I have now been sent to you. And while he was still speaking the word to me, I stood trembling. And then he said to me, do not fear, Daniel, for the first day that you set your heart to understand and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard, and I have come because of your words. Isn't that beautiful? Folks, I want to tell you that if you really seek God with all of your heart, you start to live a holy life. I'm not trying to say keeping every single law and being legalistic. I'm talking about with your heart. You know, when you love someone with that intensity, you don't want to hurt them. You don't want to disappoint them. If you really love your wife, sir, you will not be able to have an affair with that woman at work. It won't happen because of your love for her. Not because the Bible says that if you do that, you are an adulterer and you're destined for hell. No, no, no. It's the love that you have for your wife that will keep you pure. And vice versa. The same thing with you children. If you really love your parents, you'll abstain from alcohol, drugs, um, fornication, theft, all those type of things. Because you love your folks. Now, if you really love Jesus, this man from Galilee, you'll stop sinning blatantly. Because you know it offends him. Now, Daniel did that. Daniel was fasting. Daniel would not, would not partake of strong drink. He wouldn't even eat meat. He was eating vegetables because that's what he wanted to do at that time. And he started to seek the Lord. Remember, there was an edict given to the whole country. No one was to worship any other God but Nebuchadnezzar. And he defied that. The Bible doesn't say that he closed his curtains in the morning when nobody was watching and he had his quiet time. No, 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 no. He opened his curtains wide and he prayed to the living God. That, that got him into big trouble. He ended up in the lion's den. That's right. And what happened? The lions ate him. No, they didn't, young man. <laughs> they did not eat him. And I'm telling you something now. That shook the Babylonians. Because when he was taken out of that lion's den, by the way, they weren't tame lions. They threw the accusers into the den. And before they hit the ground, they were torn apart and devoured by those rav ra lions that were ravished. I want to say to you, if you get serious for God, God will get serious for you. If you play the fool with God and you use him and manipulate him, you'll get nothing from him. Daniel had no ulterior motive but to worship God. And God revealed himself to Daniel. There was other men standing there. They didn't see it. Same thing happened to a man by the name of Saul of Tarsus. That's right. He was going to Damascus to kill the Christians. What happened? He was knocked off his horse in the middle of the day. No one else could see anything, only him. And he met with Jesus. I want to tell you that Jesus Christ is more real to me than you sitting in that chair listening to me. That's right. How do you know that, Angus? Because I have experienced him. I've never seen him. No. Not many people have and have lived to tell the tale. Okay. But I've seen him in the elements. I've seen him through answered prayer. I've seen him undertake for me when I just can't go on anymore. He's been there. I've seen him and experienced him in my darkest, blackest moments. I've also seen him when I've been on the top of the mountain. I've experienced rushing mighty winds. I've seen him in fire and in the wind and in the rain. I've seen him in the face of a little baby. I've seen him. I've seen him in the face of friends, loved ones, family. You see, some of you can't see him because you're not looking for him. Okay? So open your eyes wide and you will see the power of God manifest in your life. Now, 600 years before John had that revelation of Jesus Christ, Daniel saw the Lord. After John had the revelation and he saw Jesus, okay, 
we find that there is a paper that was discovered in the archives of Rome, written at about that same time that Jesus walked on the earth 2,000 years ago. Now, this is what it says, and I'm going to read it to you. In the archives in Rome, okay, there is a report written nearly 2,000 years ago by a Roman, a Gentile. His name is Publius Lentulus, and he wrote this letter to his emperor, Tiberius. And this is what it reads. This makes me always cry when I read this. There has appeared in Palestine a man who is still living and whose power is extraordinary. He has the title given to him of great prophet. His disciples call him the son of God. He raises the dead. And he heals all sorts of diseases. Folks, this is a letter written by an unbeliever. He wasn't a Jew. He is a tall, well-proportioned man. And there is an air of severity in his countenance. He wasn't a fickle man, folks. He wasn't uh, cracking a joke every five minutes. This man was sincere. He had a mission. He was going places. That's what that means severity in his countenance, which at once attracts the love and reverence of those who see him. I want to say to you, watching this program, don't talk about Jesus Christ as the man upstairs. Don't talk about Jesus Christ as my, my mate. I want to suggest something to you. He is not your mate. He is your God. He is a holy God. He is a righteous God. We need to Respect him as such. His hair is the color of new wine from the roots to the ears and thence to the shoulders. It is curled and falls down to the lowest part of them. Upon the forehead, it parts after the manner of the Nazarenes. Jesus was a Nazarene, by the way. They didn't cut their hair, right? His forehead is flat and fair. His face is without blemish or defect and adorned with a graceful expression. His nose and mouth are very well proportioned. His beard is thick and the color of his hair. His eyes are gray and extremely lively. What does that mean? It means he's taking in everything. When he's talking to you, he sees everything. He sees right through you. As I'm talking to you now, God is looking into your heart, sir. You can hide all kinds of things from other people, but not from God. Can you imagine when Jesus looked at you, not with um, condemnation, not with judgment, but with love, but right through into your heart? <laughs> Have you ever had that happen to you? That's right. Jesus is looking into your heart as I'm talking to you now. So you can't hide anything from him. Okay? His nose and his mouth are very well proportioned. His beard is thick. And the color of his hair. His eyes are gray and extremely lively. In his reproof, he is terrible. What does that mean? When he wants to speak to you severely, if he wants to sort you out, if he wants to challenge you on something that you are not doing right, it is severe. It is terrible. But in his exhortations and instructions, amiable and courteous. He's a gentleman. The Lord's a gentleman, folks. Treat him like a gentleman, not like your buddy. He is not your buddy. I'm telling you, he is your creator. I'm going to get into trouble now. I know that, but that's the truth. You know, I've got five children. I love my children so much. And they love me. And I hope I'm one of their best friends. But I'm more than that. I'm their dad. I'm their father. And when they come to speak to me about serious things, they speak to me with respect. They don't call me by my first name. I'm their dad. I'm not their friend. I'm not their, their China, as they say in that slang. I'm their father. And they ask me in a proper manner. Now, that's how we should be treating Jesus. He is not our equal. He is our God. Okay? There is something wonderfully charming in his face with a mixture of gravity. See, he's not our laugh a minute, folks. He is never seen to laugh this is what this man says. But has been observed to weep. 
Jesus weeps more than he laughs. He loves you and I so much. When he sees the mess we make of our lives, sometimes it breaks his heart. He is very straight in stature. His hands are large and spreading. That's understandable. He's a carpenter. He's a tradesman. Strong hands. And his arms are very beautiful. He talks little, but with great quality. And he is the handsomest man <laughs> in the world. Oh, you know, folks, I get emotional when I tell you that. That's, that's our God we're talking about. It's our savior. It's our champion. He's somebody that you can be proud of. Why is it that we're always so ashamed, it appears that way anyway, to mention his name or to speak of him in a personal way when we are amongst, in amongst the world? Oh, well, Angus, they'll laugh at me. Don't worry. That's all they can do. They can't do anything more. It's time for us to give an account of the character and the personality of our Savior. And if you can't do that, I need to challenge you. Maybe you're not even born again. Maybe you don't even know him as your Savior. Friends, he's been a, such a close friend to me for close on, yeah, well over 35 years now. I may not, I dare not turn my back on him. I dare not make excuses for being a, a Christian. He never did anything wrong. You don't read in this book that he ever abused a woman. He never took advantage of a child. He never stole any money from the poor. In fact, quite the opposite. He was straightforward. He was always defending the weak. He's our savior. He's our champion. Indeed, he is the handsomest man in the world. Now, I want to pray for you as we close. I want to pray that God will give you a revelation of this man from Galilee. This is not somebody where you join a holy club and then you get membership and then you start to meet him. No, no, no. He's an individual. Whether you're watching this program in the bush somewhere, in hospital, in prison, there's no church available. You can still have fellowship with this man. Let us pray. Father, I want to pray for my friends watching this program. I just feel your presence right now, Holy Spirit. Please show these precious souls. Some of them really hurting today. Some of them lost. Some of them lacking direction. Show them your son. Let them know beyond any shadow of a doubt that he's real, he's alive, and he's coming back soon. Give them courage to run the race, that they might never, ever feel lonely again. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Until the next time on this program, remember, he is for real. Goodbye.